Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Top Tirson aides resign amid State Department shuffle. Two top aides to Rex Tirson will also be leaving the State Department by the end of the month, officials confirmed on Wednesday, in the latest fallout from President Donald Trump's decision to fire the embattled Secretary of State. The departures of Margaret P. Turlin, Tirson's chief of staff, and Christine Ciccone, his deputy chief of staff who is overseeing an initiative to redesign the State Department, will please many U.S. diplomats. Many state staffers say the two were widely disliked for severely limiting access to the secretary, sidelining career diplomats and slowing down an already cumbersome decision-making process. And now, however, another top aide, Brian Hook, appears to be staying in place. Hook has also spurred resentment in Foggy Bottom for using the division under his control, the policy planning staff to effectively take over many decisions and tasks traditionally left to the department's regional and functional bureaus. The department announced Wednesday that Hook will lead the U.S. delegation to an international meeting later this week in Vienna on the status of the Iran nuclear deal, which Trump has threatened to scuttle. Peterlin and Ciccone offered their resignations to Tirson on Tuesday, a State Department official said, confirming an earlier report by CNN. Secretary Tirson accepted their resignations with regret and thanked them for their service, the official said. Their resignations will be effective March 31 to help Secretary Tirson with the transition. Months of speculation that Trump would fire Tirson became a reality on Tuesday, when the president sent a tweet bidding Tirson farewell and announcing he would nominate CIA Director Mike Pompeo to be his new Secretary of State. Trump and Tirson had failed to see eye to eye on a range of topics including how to deal with the Iran nuclear agreement, which was negotiated by former President Barack Obama's administration. Tirson, who had just returned from a truncated trip to African countries, said later in the day Tuesday that he would immediately delegate his responsibilities to Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan. But he said that his official last day will be March 31, in part to help ensure an orderly transition. State Department employees are tentatively hopeful that Pompeo will be a better manager of the department, although many are wary of his foreign policy instincts, which are far more hawkish than Tirson's. But several civil and foreign service employees said it was critical for Tirson's aides to leave along with him, a clean sweep, as one put it, to help boost the unusually low morale at state. Tirson's departure leaves many questions, however including whether Pompeo will keep pursuing the redesign, which has come to increasingly revolve around technological and human resources changes. Pompeo's Senate confirmation hearing is expected to be held in April. Head of Major Insurer Lobby Stepping Down After Turbulent Term Marilyn Tavener is stepping down after three tumultuous years at the helm of America's health insurance plans, a K Street powerhouse that's seen its influence decline as Washington grew more hostile to Obamacare. Tavener oversaw a heap as Republicans took full control of the federal government, hellbent on dismantling the 2010 health care law. The industry group was forced to take on that fight with diminished resources, with three of the country's largest insurers, United Health Group, Aetna and Humana, dropping out of the organization in recent years. AHIP spent $6.5 million on lobbying last year, a nearly 40% decline from four years earlier. Tavener will be replaced by Matt Hiles, who is currently the lobby's chief operating officer. The 2015 hiring of Tavener, who served as CMS administrator under former President Barack Obama, was initially seen as a coup following the departure of Ahip's longtime, dynamic leader Karen Ignani. But having one of the most prominent faces of Obamacare at the head of the organization became less of an asset after President Donald Trump took office seeking to wipe out his predecessor's health care legacy. Insurers suffered a pair of high-profile hits on their Obamacare business in recent months, 
despite their efforts to stabilize the law's fragile marketplaces. Trump scrapped cost-sharing subsidy payments to insurers in October, and Republicans repealed the law's individual mandate in their tax cut package. Health insurers did score a couple major wins in Washington last year. They helped fight off massive Medicaid cuts Republican lawmakers proposed as part of the Obamacare repeal effort, and Congress suspended the law's health insurance tax for 2019. In addition, private Medicare and Medicaid plans have continued to prosper regardless of which party is in power. There's so much happening at the state level around Medicaid, Isles told Politico, citing the possibility that more states will expand Medicaid and conservative states will add work requirements to the program. I think Medicaid is going to be a key priority for the foreseeable future. Even as several major insurers have split from my heap, the group added a dozen new members last year. That includes WellCare, one of the country's largest Medicaid plans. We finished last year in a really strong financial position, Isles said. Isles joined AHIP in 2015, leading its policy and regulatory work. He previously served as a vice president at Coventry Healthcare, which is now part of Aetna. His resume also includes stints with drug makers Pfizer and Eli Lilly, as well as the CBO. Tavener is retiring on June 1st. Isles will take over the top job at what remains a precarious time for the insurance industry. Republicans are unlikely to take another stab at dismantling the Affordable Care Act anytime soon, after their repeated failures last year. But the Obamacare markets remain shaky, with dwindling competition and skyrocketing premiums. Insurers are currently pushing to get a stabilization package included in the omnibus spending bill that needs to clear Congress by March 23. But Democrats and Republicans remain sharply divided on the details, leaving the prospects for inclusion looking remote. We think it's critically important to get a stabilization, premium reduction package in place, Isles said. The time is now. Ryan No Gateway Money If Trump Will Veto Omnibus Speaker Paul Ryan warned New York and New Jersey Republicans that he won't allow funds for the Gateway Project to be included in a massive spending package if it will cause President Donald Trump to veto the bill, according to GOP lawmakers. Rep. Peter King, NY, one of a group of Republicans who met with the Speaker on Wednesday to lobby for Gateway Money, said Ryan described Trump as totally opposed to helping fund the $30 billion infrastructure project. That's the only issue that he's really talking about, Ryan said of Trump's opposition to Gateway, according to King. Trump has brought it up on four different occasions, King added. Ryan warned the GOP group that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Archi, didn't want Gateway funds in the omnibus package either. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, DNY, has pushed hard for gateway money, seeing it as key to bolstering New York City's flagging infrastructure. Ryan told the rank-and-file members to work out a deal with Trump themselves. King will spend some time with Trump on Thursday at a St. Patrick's Day celebration. Ryan, said if we can find a way to do it that the president will accept, he has no opposition to it at all, King added. But he doesn't want to pass a bill that the president is going to veto. King said that he will vote against the omnibus if it fails to include any gateway funds. Lawmakers are expected to take up the $1 trillion-plus package next week, before the March 23 government funding deadline. Other attendees at the meeting with Ryan included GOP reps. Leonard Lance, N.J., Christopher Smith, N.J., Daniel Donovan, N.Y., Claudia Tinney, N.Y., Frank Lobiondo, N.J., John Faso, NY, Tom MacArthur, NJ, and Lee Zeldin, NY. We explained to the Speaker our very strong position that we favor its inclusion in the appropriations bill, Lance said. I do not believe there is any problem with Speaker Ryan, we expressed our strongest opinion that this is of national significance. The Gateway program costs an estimated $30 billion, with the long sought tunnel project alone tallying $13 billion. Under an agreement worked out by the Obama administration, New York and New Jersey would pay half the cost, 
with the federal government picking up the rest. House Appropriations Committee Chairman Rodney Freelingason, R&J, has been pushing hard for the project in the omnibus package. Frey E. Lingason is retiring at the end of this Congress, and he is using his influence to push through an initial down payment on the program. But Trump has balked at the cost, suggesting New York and New Jersey haven't agreed to pay enough of the overall tab and threatened to veto the omnibus bill if the House included gateway funds in there. Trump administration officials and conservative Republicans are also upset that Freelingason voted against the tax cut bill, Trump's biggest legislative achievement and initially balked at repealing Obamacare. Connor Lamb thanks Trump supporters after too close to call an election. Democratic congressional candidate Connor Lamb said Wednesday that his claimed victory in Tuesday's special election in Pennsylvania's 18th congressional district came, at least in part thanks to supporters of President Donald Trump who voted for him. While Lamb claimed victory in the pre-dawn hours Wednesday morning, the Associated Press still shows the race as too close to call. As of Wednesday morning, Lamb led Republican candidate Rick Saccone by just 641 votes. Look, I was at a lot of polling places yesterday with cars parked outside of them that had President Trump's bumper sticker on them. So he's a popular person here. Lamb told CNN's New Day on Wednesday. But I think that what happens when you campaign in real life as much as possible is that those divisions go away. Everyone gave me a fair shake and I know that there are people that voted for the president who also voted for me. And, you know, I thank them for hearing me out. Regardless of the race's actual winner, that Lamb has run such a competitive race has been seen as worrisome for Republicans who are expected to face an uphill battle in next November's midterm elections. Trump won Pennsylvania's 18th congressional district in 2016 by 20 points and until the resignation of former GOP Representative Tim Murphy last fall, the southwestern Pennsylvania district had been represented by a Republican since 2003. Trump made two appearances in the district over the course of the special election campaign, including a rally last Saturday night where he pinned the Democratic candidate with the nickname Lamb the Sham and sought to tie him to House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, Democrat California, whom Lamb has vowed he would not support for the party's leadership. Lamb conceded that the president's appearances likely had improved voter turnout but also said voters in his district had tired of the type of vitriol that has been a hallmark of Trump's campaigning style long before Air Force One touched down in southwestern Pennsylvania. There was a lot of foolishness in this election and a lot of really cartoonish campaigning. And I think by the time of the president's visit last weekend, people were kind of tired of that entire approach, Lamb said. I mean, I had people especially elderly people coming up to me almost every day and just saying, man, I hate those ads against you. It's not right. It's not worthy of us. And so I think there was just a little bit of burnout on that type of campaigning before the president ever got here.